Hi, this is RGK and I will recap roguelite first person shooter games that have been released to this day. Probably not every single one of them in existence, but the most well known games. First, before talking about FPS games, I would like to clarify a misunderstanding that comes up often. This mistake around the word roguelike itself. The word is often used indiscriminately by people who have no idea what it actually refers to. Everyone makes a mistake, so it's pretty commonplace and it has become normal. Thus a reminder of the definition of the word won't hurt. With some luck, it will help people understand what they're talking about and hopefully stop spreading misinformation. My hopes are probably too high, as Total Biscuit already tried to do the same and the word is still widely misused. If you're not interested in this stock on definitions, jump straight to the timestamp on the screen to only see the FPS recap. Roguelike is a genre in and of itself. It makes no sense to use the word to describe platformers or first-person shooters, both are rich and different genre. Which means that if someone likes a classical roguelike genre and is asking for more games belonging to that genre, that person often receives irrelevant replies such as the Binding of Isaac. It's as if someone was asking for a new FPS and you replied Hotline Miami because there are guns too. Initially, roguelike is a term used to describe games that are like rogue. You can see what it looks like on the screen, and don't tell me that you see a platformer. It's a genre of games released in the 80s and 90s featuring games like Moria, Nethack, Adam or Angband. During the International Roguelike Development Conference 2008, specialists of the genre agreed on a specific list of characteristics that would help identify whether a game belongs to the roguelike genre. It was called the Berlin Interpretation and it is not a strict definition but rather a guide. High value factors include permanent death and random environment generation as you probably already knew. However, it also includes the requirement that levels are made of a grid and the action has to be turn based. It's easy to remember, no? So next time someone pretends that a game is a roguelike and it's not even top down and turn based, you can straight up slap them in the face and they should thank you. You will have done a good deed and prevented misinformation from spreading. Hero of the modern times. I will skip through explanations of other factors such as dying from hunger if you don't eat food and move on to low value factors. Here we have the fact that monsters are supposed to follow the same rules as a player, so if you see a flying boss whereas your movements do not allow it, well something might be wrong there. Please note that ASCII display is secondary because of course graphics are known to get better over time. Among modern roguelikes, following these guidelines while sometimes improving on the interface and adding elements of a meta progression, you can find Hack, Tangle Deep, Dragon Fangs, or Paper Dungeon Scrawler. So here you have it, roguelikes are their own genre separate from the rest, and it's more than likely that you have never played a single true roguelike game considering how niche they are. Just like all games featuring guns are not called first person shooters, it's still possible to take inspiration from their mechanics and apply them to another game such as with Portal combining first person and puzzles. The same goes for roguelikes. Some of their game mechanics can be applied to something else. In this case we are not talking about the genre in and of itself, but design rules apply to another genre. For example, these design rules can be added to a platformer or a tactics game. Some of these features have been grouped to form a system called roguelite. Light as if there was a diet since it retains only a handful features and not the rest. Some used to say roguelike-like, which literally means games are like the games are like rogue. On Wikipedia, hybrid roguelikes also appears. At some point, some tried to push for the term procedural death labyrinth to make the name sound different from roguelike, but it does not easily roll off the tongue and did not take root, so its usage has been halted by now. The developers of the game Rogue Legacy are the first ones who have coined the term roguelite. Considering that most people never heard about Rogue and suppose it was probably just another action platformer, confusion between roguelike and roguelite stemmed instantly. Well, they kinda sound the same, but at this point it's past due time to stop confusing everything and let classical roguelite games live their life, while the derived games are labeled under roguelite to mark their difference. When talking about roguelite games, there are two obligatory principles for a game to belong to that category and then two frequent principles that are not obligatory. Once again we need some sort of permanent death that means the loss of a character and the equipment it was carrying when they died. It's part of the expected experience, contrary to game that simply proposed to go back to a previous save by turning back the clock. Then this has to be combined with procedural environment generation, 
which means that the adventure will be different each run, prioritizing levels designed by an algorithm or an assembly from handmade pieces. Generally, but not mandatory, there is a predefined end to the story or the adventure, a time when the game acknowledges that the player succeeded in their mission or met a final boss. Lastly, there is almost always a meta progression or permanent progression. Each run contributes to unlocking new things to use or to upgrade the character, to access new content that was previously unavailable or unlock shortcut portals. This permanent progression was absolutely not present in older roguelike games and they did not feature an ending either, but it's gradually coming to the recent games of the genre as well, with for example unlockable characters or piggy banks to save coins across runs. The two main ingredients of roguelite games, permanent death and procedural environment generation, can be applied to a completely different genre that is not turn based on a grid. Besides the hardcore mode of Diablo, the first famous game to retrieve these elements and use them in a new genre was Spelunky by Derek Yu. This game impressed Edmund Macmillan, who then developed The Binding of Isaac. Isaac had a strong influence on the shaping of the style of roguelite games. It is also responsible for the trend that was to obfuscate useful information instead of displaying it, which pushed players to keep a browser tab open with the game's wiki page, such as with Don't Starve. Thankfully, this trend is now on the decline. In any case, the roguelite design seduced the indie game's world and many games adopted its principles. For developers, it's good because it allows creating a lot of content without having to do everything by hand. For gamers, it's good because it permits launching the game often and to face a strong challenge. Permanent means that each tentative attempt has high stakes and a lot of tension. But since it became a trend, the roguelite brand was added to a lot of games in order to get people to talk about the product, whereas without the roguelite aspect, these games would be instantly forgotten since their core gameplay is not very fun. Furthermore, a lot of roguelite games rely too much on progression to increase the player's damage output to have enough chances to survive, which contributes to our artificial longevity of the title. Another issue is that always retreating the same steps can quickly become too repetitive. At first, there are lots of new things to see, but then you can get repeatedly stuck in the same environment with the same tools every time. This is an interesting paradox, as randomness should provide wholly different adventures each time, and yet it can be limited or become streamlined to the point that each run feels all too similar. On the other hand, if everything relies on luck, it's possible to have garbage runs that you itch to restart because you are dealt a bad hand. Total length of a run can have an impact as well. If a game can be finished in half an hour or one hour, restarting a new run is quick and easy, but for adventures that last more than 2 hours, it can be very off-putting to restart the game and realize you have wasted the rest of your evening. One of the reasons that developers go for an increased longevity is that hardcore gamers love roguelite for their tough challenge and lack of saves. It harkens back to the 8-bit era when games had no saves allowed and it was obligatory to finish the adventure in one go. While there are gamers who indiscriminately want games that will keep them busy for 100 or 1000 hours, pushing the developers to design long and difficult games such as The Binding of Isaac, there are other developers who deliver shorter adventures such as City of Brass for gamers who enjoy a bad sized experience of 10 to 20 hours. Over time, the roguelite spirit was refined and most of its initial brutality against players has been decreased. For example, Dead Cells has a very strong protagonist right from the start, instead of begging the adventure naked, weak and crying, with good stuff only appearing after a few levels. A lot of games are starting to add teleporters to let players directly go back to the levels where they died rather than starting from the beginning over and over again. Finally, to this day I find the elegant Into the Bridge to be the roguelite game that has best refined and crystallized the formula. The reason why is that it's possible to tackle this campaign in any order, and the characters, mechs, as well as secondary objectives and achievements, make each run something that is approached in a different manner to prevent repetition from setting in as quickly as in other roguelite games. Also, the whole content of the game can be completed within a reasonable span of time. It's time well spent, and not the developers making you waste it. Finally, let's talk about first-person shooters following the roguelite principles. Roguelite FPS are relatively rare because it's harder to build good levels for an FPS than for a platformer or top-down game. And most importantly, succeeding at giving a good feeling to the gameplay is harder than it seems. Simply laying down the history is not very interesting, so I will often add my opinion. Sorry if you can't stand it. For the most recent games I have not treated in their own separate videos, I'm using this opportunity to do a mini-review. I'll try to cover the list according to their official release date order. Well, except that I will break this rule just for the very first game, as even though Delver was available for players since 2012, 
It only left the early access phase in 2018. The universe of its dungeons is full of colors and cute enemies that are 2D sprites, just like in the Doom-like era. A truly nice game. It's not for the bloodthirsty, but since it's very accessible, it earned a very solid reputation. It's the opposite for Paralogical Activity, which was temporarily banned from Steam when one of its developers treated a death threat aimed at Game Newell, founder of the platform. The game has a structure very similar to Isaac, but with voxel and dark rooms. It did not age well, but at least it was going for fast-paced combat when you were lucky enough to find a good weapon. Receiver had the original concept of featuring a gun that required to be manipulated very finely with a key for each action. Eldritch was a personal favorite when it was released, with its weird world inspired by Lovecraft's bestiary. Its destructible environments remind of a Minecraft gone mad and populated with vicious beasts, including weeping angel statues that only move when you turn your back, and I had a lot of fun sneaking always deeper in these strange places. Tower of Guns has epic aerial battles in gigantic rooms busy with projectiles, but the gunplay is a bit weak. In heavy bullets each bullet matters and you have to pick them up on the ground. So in the end it's a bit like shooting arrows. Or nerf guns, not very exciting. Mainly because there was little competition at that time, Ziggurat became well known. Fantasy universes are not too common in shooters, and for good reason. Pew pew magic ones are not especially satisfying. Despite this, Ziggurat is a very well made game and has been the staple FPS roguelite for a long time. Space Beast Terror Fright is largely inspired by the movie Aliens and it's a very stressful experience. The game has been on early access for a long time and the developers seem to struggle to give it a direction despite a very solid foundation, but now and then I love diving in the belly of its spaceship to spread monster guts before being eaten myself. It can be played in local and online co-op. I don't know Barony very well, but it can also be played with online co-op. It seems to be very inspired by old school dungeon crawlers such as Ultima or Daggerfall, and also the true classic roguelikes. Wasted sends us deep in post-apocalyptic bunkers with a followed feel if you manage to survive its limited environment management that completely breaks the pacing of the game. Especially annoying considering that time is precious and an overpowered enemy shows up if you linger for too long. I'm gonna, I'm gonna kill ya. Strafe was selling dreams with its brilliant promotional campaign linking the title to Quake. And it's true that the visual style is very reminiscent. However, the result is disappointing for anyone expecting gunfights and level design on a similar level. There are teleporters to go straight to later areas, but since they are hard to build, it's more a secret than a normal system. A little something is missing to make the game really work, but it's still a good offering and I like this game better than the next. Immortal Redneck looks like a Ziggurat clone, but with pyramids and real weapons. Well, I shouldn't say that so fast, the weapons are not feeling much better than magic wands, in levels that are too big not to fall asleep while walking through them. And lots of grind is required to increase the stats of the character, which I think does not work in first person shooters. It's a shame, because there is also an interesting platformer element with the possibility to grab ledges like in the recent Doom games. Even though I did not appreciate this title, I can't deny that some people enjoy it. Everspace gives you a spaceship to soar through space and battle among asteroid fields. 
I will sound picky again, but I found the experience frustrating, especially since that there are again stats to upgrade, but still, many players enjoyed the dogfights and the pretty visuals. You won't spend your life on Still Not Dead, and actually, there is no permanent progression. Nonetheless, it's a real pleasure with quick sessions. Despite the lack of vertical aim, the weapons offer a great feeling. It's fast and violent with terrifying moments when the screen turns red and death itself is chasing after you across the level. Bonus points for the great enemy variety, with for instance those that create a stasis around you to trap you. City of Brass is a game on this list that is most looking like a AAA title from a big studio as it is graphically gorgeous and a technical marvel. It's not a shooter, but the sharp blades are very powerful and the whip is fantastic. With all the traps in the levels, I had as much fun as in good old Dark Messiah. This game is easier than the other roguelite offerings and it's possible to finish it within a few runs, which is usually quite refreshing. Among the other refreshments, there are portals to skip directly to more advanced level, and the game is not a grind to increase stats. All killer, no filler. I'm surprised that Bunker Punks appears among the latest games to have been released as it feels very dated already. The gunfights are awful, and it actually makes me sad that this game managed to be better known than Still Not Dead, which also features sprites as enemies but is much better on every level. Mother Gunship is kind of a sequel to Tower of Guns, with gunfights that are a little more nervous, but the levels are a little less epic. This game can be played in online co-op. There is lots of good there, as well as less good, but I will point out the step-by-step -step progression that makes the campaign more accessible. When you die, you lose precious equipment and the last dungeon that you visited disappears, but you are never forced to go back to the very beginning. It's as if the game was a succession of smaller roguelites playing each after another. Polygon is quite ugly, but I still had a good time with its first level that is built in an interesting way, both open and closed with lots of different enemies that can be quite challenging, but they frequently drop some health to compensate. A large number of upgrades change the behavior of the one gun and is very promising. Then comes the first boss fight and things take a turn for the absurd. It flies faster than your bullets, so without the right upgrades, such as the laser, it's truly a pain. Then there is a level where the beautiful freedom of movement of the first level is now restrained by a surrounding void and invincible enemies with splash damage, whereas the remaining opponents are way too resistant. Balancing is clearly lacking and there is no permanent progression to compensate for this. I almost forgot, but this game also features online co-op. Hypergun also has only one gun to upgrade, but here it's clearly not fun as most modifications are plus 10% this and minus 5% that. With some luck you can find secondary attacks, but there is not even a melee attack to fend off enemies that are too sticky. Globally it's not very exciting and shooting enemies quickly becomes very very monotonous, especially since they are all too resistant. Meta progression is as often slow and tedious as you grind for a few stats boosts, but the welcome teleporters are here. Well, that is if you're not bored of doing the same thing over and over. It's a shame the visual style and the music contribute to a great atmosphere. We are done with this overview. I hope that I helped you understand the difference between roguelike and roguelite, and that I maybe helped you discover some good games that you missed. My current favorites are City of Brass, Space Beast Terror Fright, Eldritch, Still Not Dead and Delver. But there has still not been an ultimate shooter that crushes the competition and gets everyone on board. Therefore, dear developers, the King's Crown is still up for grabs. My thanks to Jeremy, Total Biscuit and Spike for their precious words when I was preparing this video. I hope you enjoyed this video, and now I need to take a long break. Bye!